Okay. Well, uh, first and foremost, just want to thank Dr. Farrell and uh, everybody here for giving me the opportunity to come. Um, thank Gonzaga School of Engineering, two friends for coming out to support me. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about the manufacturing of the LED or the light emitting diode. Um, kind of a strange passion of mine is lighting, and I kind of it's paid the bills through college is doing live concert lighting. So I decided, let's find out how this stuff works. So a little bit about the light emitting diode. It's not a light bulb; it emits light. So what we're going to study is that little green square inside the light emitting diode that actually creates the light. Because I never understood how it was created, why it was colored. So this is uh, kind of news to me as well, and I enjoyed the opportunity to do the research. So some uses for LEDs. Pretty much anywhere you see light, there can be an LED. You can use it for clocks, Christmas lights. Uh, we got some engineers in the room, so you guys probably aren't any strangers to the Audi headlights. Um, most famous <laughs> application of LEDs, quite possibly, the uh, Dallas Cowboys new screen, 10,584,064 LEDs. I in no way support what the Dallas Cowboys do, but there's their screen. Um, Gonzaga score sign, I'm on board with that. Also, my bedroom, I'm a big advocate of the LED. So there's your proof. That's actually my room. So uh, why LEDs? So LED obviously substitute to the halogen bulb. Substantially less power. Everybody knows that. So here is an example of, I don't want to shine anybody's eyes, but brought in a little LED can here, has red, green, and blue LEDs, and as the colors mix, you can obviously create um, every color. So that's one of the advantages of LEDs, is they can be made into a specific color, and they use little, little power um, as an alternative to what would be the kind of filament lamp right there. So 75 watts is your average light bulb, in your house, and I'm going to try and do something with this before it gets upset. Let's we'll put it on the roof so we can look at it. Same with me here. Same with me. Here we go. All right. So for the same amount of lumen output that you would get from a 50 to 75 watt filament bulb in your house, you can use nine watts uh, to supply that with an LED, and that's a lumen count that is based on the. Uh, it's a measure of light output. So. That's the wattage that you can use, the difference in wattage, you get the same amount of light. LEDs produce little to no heat. That's probably very hot, and this will sit here at room temperature all night long. I could let it run for the rest of the day. So heat dissipation is not an issue with the LED. Hard plastic, so everybody has probably dropped a light bulb in their life. They're often vacuum sealed with the filament so that it kind of decreases or increases the longevity of the filament. So as you shatter the bulb, it doesn't take a whole lot before the whole thing just blows in on itself. LED has a hard plastic shell, it's injection molded, so that's another advantage is they're very durable. And quite possibly the best advantage of all is they last 50 to 100,000 hours. Unlike your filament or halogen bulb that will last around 1,000. So moving on, with uh, all the advantages that come with LEDs, it sticks with the theory of there's no free lunch. So although they are huge on the money saving energy side, they're not real easy to manufacture. So that's kind of the flip side of the coin. It's timely, you have to be very precise, and it's an expensive operation, and that's what we're gonna talk a little bit about today, the process about that. So, as was pointed out earlier, inside the LED is the little semiconductor wafer, and it's made very similar to the way a computer chip is made, and that's with a single crystal semiconductor ingot. And the way that that works is the primary ingredients in a computer chip ingot are silicone. Um, silicone, yeah. Silicon? Silicon. All right. So, <laughs> I don't want to get the wrong one. So, at the very top is a picture of an ingot that is used to make computer chips, because I couldn't actually find one, that has the gallium arsenic and uh, phosphorus, as in an LED. But the picture of the ingot being drawn out of the uh, molten metal crucible is actually the correct material. So, the way that this works is you melt this gallium arsenic compound down, you put a seed rod into it and slowly draw it out while counter-rotating the molten metal bath and the seed rod the opposite direction and you draw them out at such a slow speed that all of the molecules of this alloy align the exact same way. So it's a single crystal, whereas your average metal is comprised of many different crystals in many different directions. And the reasoning for that, um, as you go on in this process, it's just so that you have predictable electron behavior. There's no dislocations in the metal that impede electron flow. So that's a little bit about how the ink gets formed and why. And then, once the wafer, once the ingot is made, you have to slice it into wafers. They're about 10 mils thick is the average thickness of these wafers. The wafers are then polished to ensure a smooth surface again, following with the single crystal theory of 
let's minimize as many impurities as possible. So if there's no surface impurities and roughness, you again can get predictable electron flow on these. Uh, and again, that plays into why they have to be the single crystal as well. So then comes even the more precise process of cleaning the wafer. That's a lapping machine. And once these wafers are polished to what would seem to be a perfectly smooth surface, they're put in this lapping machine, rotated while counter-rotating on a different axis. And it's a fine, fine grit fluid that's put through this machine. And they're rubbed to almost a near perfect finish. Um, the cleaner the wafer, the better the efficiency, the more predictable the behavior, and the easier it is to maximize the amount of LEDs you can get per wafer. Now, where this starts to break apart from the manufacturing of a computer chip is right here. Once the wafer is basically pristine, you now put it into a, uh, a bath of different kind of what are called doping uh, chemicals. And this process is called liquid phase equitaxy, and you take this semiconductor wafer and you lay um, different kind of doping fluids on top of it and it's not made of the same semiconductive material as the base wafer but they align in the same kind of single crystal way which is a unique to the process so it's a different molecular structure but they all align the same way and that allows when a charge is passed through it for electrons to jump from one semiconductive material to another and that's what emits the light which I did not know so it's not at all related to a filament, it has to do with electron orbitals and electrons jumping, which is why an LED can only be used in one direction. If you were to take an LED and flip it around on a board, everything behind it would go out, because electrons only go one way in this process. So with that, this doping process lends itself to creating different colors of the LED. So whatever semiconductor you put on top of the initial base wafer will dictate the color and will dictate the way that the electrons jump from semiconductor to semiconductor material, the different wavelengths and the different frequencies they do that create the different colors. In the old days, you used to get white only. You'd have to put it in a hard plastic shell of a color. Nowadays, um, they advance the process. There's just a couple different elements that'll create different colors. Not important, but interesting nonetheless. Um, the wafers are then covered in photoresist. This is kind of a technical process, so we're just going to gloss over it. So once the wafers are finished being doped, they have a photoresist put over them. And what that does is when ultraviolet light is shot onto it, this is a negative doping process. So the part that has the light shined onto it remains a liquid. The rest of it turns hard. So you flash this onto the uh, photoresist, wash the rest of the photoresist away, and some of it's going to stay where you don't want metal to go into. So now you're going to have these peaks and valleys, the valleys being uh, the base metal of the ingot. And at that point, you're going to evaporate metal into it and then finish by washing away the rest of the photoresist. And you're going to have a very precise uh, layout of electrical leads on this little board. So in a two inch diameter ingot, you're going to get about 6,000 what would be LEDs or those little wafers that go inside each of the hard plastic shells. And the photoresist is what can be thanked for that process. That's why LEDs are kind of a recent thing, because this photoresist kind of projecting light and then washing away, inserting metal, and then cleaning it totally is kind of a new thing. So there's an actual LED wafer. Uh, two leads are being kind of dragged around it to test the LEDs on the board. But the real inefficiency in this process is you don't get 6,000 LEDs out of each wafer. You get about 70% of them because you have to deal with the preciseness of cutting them which is the other kind of no free lunch part of this operation is as they're cut, inevitably you, you lose some and again, 70% of them come out and it's kind of a balancing act between do I get a high precision expensive machine to cut them all out or do I get a little bit less expensive machine and risk losing some of them. So that's kind of the balancing act of that part of the process. The LED wafer is then placed on top of a metal lead and then encased in a hard plastic shell which lends it to its durability and uh, a little gold wire is attached on the top of it so that that way electricity is passing through the two different semiconductor layers and uh, that in turn is what produces the light. If you want it on a board, you can go ahead and solder them on a board. You don't have to have the leads, but there you go. Your general colors of the LED, red, green, blue, and white. So kind of the way of the future is the LED, because of its efficiency, everybody's going green these days, uh, power, is an important thing becoming more expensive as oil goes up since we have to burn oil to make power. Maybe not in this part of the world, but in Arizona we do, where I'm from. So that's just kind of what drew me to the LED. I really like the way it looks. I have a bunch of them in my room. Um, 
And I was very interested in finding out what basically makes them tick. And I learned that it's an extremely complicated process, kind of a, a brother to the computer chip in a way. So I hope that was enlightening, my shameless pun of a joke right there. And uh, those are my work cited again, if anybody wants to follow up on this. But thank you very much again. So questions? Yeah, um, I know that LEDs, you mostly see them in really tiny. Are there any like various sizes, and would there be any benefits to having larger sized LEDs? Well, that's, that's true. You usually do see them as kind of a smaller indicator light of sorts. Um, these are, I don't want to shine sand. You've got an array of 100 of them, but what if you had just one big one? You could, you could do one big one. The, the largest conventional size they're made in is a 3-watt LED. Uh, the reason is once you get too big, it's hard to get what a, a, I'm going to kind of loosely explain this the way I best understand it. But as that little wafer gets too big, as you solder the lead on top, it's hard to get an even electron flow density throughout the whole thing. And if you solder multiple leads, you kind of run into the same problem of the one of least resistance is going to get it all. So it becomes an issue of how big to make that wafer. And that's really the only thing that dictates the light output is the size of the wafer. So these are larger LED bulbs, as you can see, and they're about a quarter of a watt each. And as they get bigger, obviously, the hard plastic shell has to be bigger and then turn that wafers bigger. But it does have to do with the efficiency. And again, um, I think that's one of the reasons that they're often manufactured in this fashion, that you have a bunch of smaller ones together because it just becomes kind of a headache to get one to be big. That's the way I understand it, if that made sense. Um, I'm sorry. I, go um, for different applications, most of what you're talking about would be lighting for either uh, to get color on or to light up an indicator or something like that. What about the other lighting applications? Um, for example, uh, indoor uh, hydroponic growing or something like that, or exterior lighting. Mm -hmm. um, what, what are they doing to come over the brightness barriers that are currently in place? The, the brightness barriers aren't so much with the, uh, the, I guess, the brightness. It becomes with focusing the bulb because it's a lot easier to take a string filament and kind of put a mirror behind it and focus it in the direction you want to go. So an LED has more of a pin spot of light on this wafer that is ultimately producing the same amount of lumens as that full filament would be. But the issue comes, it's really hard to make a mirror that is precise enough to focus an exact point of light. And the other issue with that is it projects it out, out from basically the top of itself. So it almost acts as its own shadow on one part of the, the mirroring if you were to do something like that. So the LED is kind of limited to something like a wash. You, I mean, you very rarely see a flashlight that is LED. They tend to stick with an arc lamp or a filament just because it's so much easier to harness that, where it's a lot harder to harness such a precise point of light. Now, as far as you know, the coloring operation, um, it is much easier to make a static than a filament bulb, uh, just because you can dictate the color so much easier without having to have a, a filter or gel on your bulb. Um, so, and they work indoor and outdoor. They're waterproof if you were to, you know, water seal the leads coming out the back of them. But, uh, you know, anywhere your general light is used, you can pretty much use an LED down to an extremely microscopic scale, and they can be used on um, boards and computer chips as a one-way pass for electricity, which is kind of the forgotten use of them, because I'm talking about light. But they can also be used as a one-way current kind of a, uh, flow check valve more or less and they do emit light when they do that operation but it's just not necessarily visible based on whatever doping operation you choose. So. And then sir, you had a question back then. Um, my understanding is in a couple of years we're all going to be buying $20 LED bulbs because they're not going to make the other kind anymore. Am I, am I tracking correctly? <sighs> you know, don't get me started on where the government sticks their nose in on stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> But, I mean, if it were up to me, heck, I mean, I, I, I don't buy these unless it's for work and paying the bills. I still use a filament bulb. I like filament bulbs. Truthfully, the light that a filament bulb emits is a lot more natural than the white light of an LED. Um, if I, I, you are correct in saying that really LEDs are the way things are going, the way street lights are going, too, just from the power savings. Um, again, 
I, that comes from my understanding that comes from more of an administrative kind of governmental regulations more than um, companies dictating this because really there's not a whole lot of promise for the process getting cheaper so until they really start to blanket everything with LEDs the savings are going to come a lot in the energy um, so that's kind of kind of the drawback if it were up to me I'd let everybody make their own decision I personally like the the LED kind of different color light options but really I think I truly I think there's no substitute for the filament bulb in an application like a lamp on your desk if it comes to a, a broader scale industrial settings you know you could probably get away with LEDs in this because you don't have to focus it it can kind of wash so uh, yes, sir. Are there any other uses for LEDs outside of the visible light spectrum? Yeah. Um, as far as if I'm if I may go back. Um, so once you've got that semiconductor and you dope other materials on top of it, uh, especially up in this higher this higher range of the wavelength emissions, you can get. Um, I know a lot of the police radar guns use kind of the light emitting diode technology but it's not in the visible spectrum. They emit an LED produced light outside the visible spectrum and then read back how it bounces back and in turn you can calculate the speed off of that. So there's applications that are extremely similar to what we use them for for light but we just can't see it. And then the other flip side of that was as a, a check valve for electricity. I say that as a mechanical engineer because check valve I get. But that's the other the other way is as it, it inhibits kind of a backflow of current and you could do that with any color but again these higher these higher above the visible light kind of ultraviolet spectrums are where they're more used infrared I couldn't find any readily available because they just don't emit enough heat to be practical as an infrared which is where a lot of that's used so that's kind of my my understanding of that and then so then um, enjoyed what you presented one of the things you said was that these LEDs last 50 to 100,000 hours. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess that's reasonable because they just grow dimmer over time. But the, the real appeal of the LED is a controller that sends power to the LED. Did you, in your research, uh, find any information about that? As far as that over the life of it getting dimmer and how that affects the power you input? Know, the, the, how the life of the controller affects the light of the LED. Um, you know, uh, not, I, I really, I can't speak to that too much because the only experience that I've really had and could find is um, basically like a wall plug. Now are you talking about the, the power supply possibly going because it's constantly having to transform power and to step it down essentially? You're, you're right. And essentially that's what Well, the LED, the way that I've understood it is the LED wafer in and of itself will last that long. You run into the bulb getting dimmer because the leads start to corrode and inhibit the current. And that, the, the power source, if you, if you have a three watt LED, it's constantly pumping three watts into it. And as the resistance in the fatiguing and corroding metal increases, it's still feeding it three watts, but three watts isn't getting to it. Now, the way that that affects the controller, I'm not sure just because I don't know if the resistance gets too high, you'll probably end up blowing the controller by sending either too little or too much current to it. But really, you are at the mercy of your surroundings more than the, the diode itself. You're at the mercy of the wiring. You're at the mercy of, as you were saying, the power supply. Um, and I mean, ultimately, 50 to 100,000 hours, whatever it's doing is probably going to break before that. Um, I mean, even something like this sitting on a desk, I mean, it would eventually something would happen to it where it would break before the LED would. So that is something that is kind of interesting is how the other technology is going to catch up to it. But at this point, I think the LED has pretty much just been a substitute for a, a filament kind of bulb. Mm -hmm.